Come on, let's sing together. And I am chosen, I am free, I am living for eternity. Yours now forever. You pick me up, turn me around, you set my feet on solid ground. I'm yours now forever. See, nothing's gonna hold me back. Nothing's gonna hold me back No, nothing's gonna hold me back Nothing's gonna hold me back Cause my chains fell off My chains fell off My heart was free I'm alive to it for you I'm alive to it for you Amazing love, how can it be? everything for me You gave everything for me Everything You wash my sin and shade away The slate is clean A brand new day Free now forever Now fully I approach your throne To claim this crown Through Christ my own Yours now forever Sing, nothing's gonna hold me back And nothing's gonna hold me back Nothing's gonna hold me back Nothing's gonna hold me back My chains fell off My chains fell off My heart was free I'm alive to live for you I'm alive to live for you Amazing love, how can it be? You gave everything for me You gave everything for me And now I'm free to live Free to care Free to be I'm free to love you Free to live Free to care Free to be, I'm free to love you Free to live, free to give, free to be I'm free to love you, Lord My chains for love, my heart was free I'm alive to live for you I'm alive to live for you How can it be? Oh, you gave everything for me. You gave everything for me. Yeah. Oh, everything for me. Good evening and welcome to Worship at the Cathedral. We're so glad that you're joining us. And uh, as we sing a couple of more songs, I hope that you will join us in, in singing and in worship. If you know that somebody who would like singing and worship, please send this link to them. And um, come on, let's all worship God together. Just 
has won it all. We sing it. Hallelujah. You are won the victory. Hallelujah.
our Savior to distant lands and farthest seas. O oh, paint the fields bright and golden, trench the high west with your rain. God's river flows with living water that flows to all. As you ordain, praise the name of the Lord, O oh, my soul, sing His worth. All of life, join the song, come and lift up our King. Now let the earth. Join the dancing, deck her out in showers of spring. The dusk and dawn forever relay the call to come and worship Him. Come on, we sing together. Oh, praise the name of the Lord, oh my soul, sing. All of life, join the song, come and lift up our King. Praise the name of the Lord, oh my soul, sing His word. All of life, join the song, come and lift up our King. blessing on you and for your wonderful grace O Lord that you so freely give and Father as we move on to dwell into your word O Father 
Father, I pray that you will give us an open heart, Lord, and open ears, so that we may be able to hide your word in our heart, Lord. And Father, no, no, no way, O oh Lord. Let us forget all of your blessings, O oh Father. But every single day, let us remember to count our blessings. And thank you, O oh Father. In Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Greeting, everybody. Uh, I hope all of you are doing good. Uh, thank you so much for joining in uh, for the e evening online service. I thank God for this opportunity that God has given me this uh, evening uh, that I could uh, come uh, in your midst and I could share God's word. Uh, I thank God uh, that he has enabled us uh, so that we uh, are able to enter uh, in a new year uh, where, where his, his word says that his mercies are new every morning and uh, we can see uh, we can believe and we are able to see his mercies are new every morning in each one of our uh, lives. So before we go into the word, uh, let's close our eyes and let's pray a uh, uh, short prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful time that you have given us. We uh, thank you for the privilege that you have given us, uh, that we are able to hear your word. We thank you, Lord, that you led us, uh, that we were able to worship. Father God, we give this entire time in your mighty hands and Lord, we pray as we hear your word, open our ears, Lord Father, open our spiritual ears, O oh Father, Father, open our hearts so that Lord, the word that you have kept for us, Lord, uh, it will be a fruitful. Lord Jesus, we pray for your seed, Lord, we pray for your word. We come at the entire time in your mighty hands. In Jesus name, we pray and everybody say amen, amen and amen. Uh, I hope all of you know that this evening uh, we are going to meditate on uh, Epistle of Romans chapter 2 verses 1 to 16. Epistles of Romans uh, chapter 2 verses 1 to 16. Uh, one of the problems that uh, we as human we can easily slip into a feeling of self-righteousness you know when we uh, look at a sinful world especially when we look at the society when we uh, look at people when we, where we uh, you know uh, look at our friends where we look at our cousins where we look at our friends uh, you know we we often come to a point of judgment and we call them as sinner and we call ourselves as better than them you know, it is not an intentional thought, but it is the reality. Yeah, it is not an intentional thought, but you know, I think we have been designed in such a way that uh, we, uh, you know, we get to judge very easily. Uh, you know, uh, we, we think we do not sin like those people. At least we are serving God. Oh, at least we are serving God in some way or the other. And we are not sinners. But they do not seem to care about God at all. And I think this is a feeling where we all go through it, you know. And uh, this is because uh, we are humans. And this is the main concern where Paul is actually uh, addressing in chapter 2. You know, in these attitudes where, uh, you know, where it, where it seems that Paul's concerns... Uh, uh, that is his major concern and he is moving from chapter 1 to chapter 2 where Paul has condemned all people as you know uh, as being without excuse in chapter 1 for being filled with a manner of unrighteousness and being given to the debased and unfit mind and over here Paul directs his attention towards the self-righteous to those who actually condemn sinner and to those who think that they are living acceptably in the sight of God and when we read chapter 2 verses 1 to 3 it says therefore you have no excuse O man every one of you who judges for in passing judgment on another you condemn yourself because you the judge practice the same very very same things we know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things do you suppose O man you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself that you will escape the judgment of God. And this is the question that he is asking. You know, Paul begins by saying that we have to know that by passing a judgment on other people, we are basically passing judgment on ourselves. You know, when we look at the sins in, uh, uh, in chapter 1 and when we point out the finger to all those uh, whom we see and we come to a conclusion, oh, this per person is a terrible sinner. 
who is violating God's law. You know, we must also see that the, there are fingers, when we point one finger, there are fingers, you know, pointing back at us. And that's what Paul is basically addressing over here. You know, the reason that the fingers point us uh, point back at us is because we have done the same things. We have done the same things. You know, we, we know that the things listed in uh, Roman, when you read Romans chapter, verse, uh, chapter 1 verses 28 to 32, you will get to know that, yes, people are sinful. And we know that God's decree that those who practice such things, they deserve to die. But we did also the same thing we did them anyway you know we are not uh, very different from those people whom we call sinners you know when you read the list in uh, romans chapter 1 verses 28 to 32 and if if you can tell me honestly that you have never done any of these sins which is you know deserving of death slander deceit strive gossip envy boastful greed arrogant and here's the list you know what we see that God's wrath has been revealed against all unrighteousness and godliness. And that includes us, not just the lost world, not just the people uh, whom we conclude, not just the people you know, whom we judge, but that includes us. You know, God's wrath is not only against the wicked, wicked debased mind that rejects God but God's wrath is also against you and me the very reason why you know we judge others while judging others we must realize in great humility that we are under the same condemnation when we judge people we also come under the same condemnation the particular context when you read over here uh, in uh, the first few chapters of Romans, you know, the context includes Israel condemning Gentiles, the Pharisees and scribes condemning Israel, and the moral Gentile philosopher condemning the society. The blame game has already started. And this blame game is not only here, I think it all started from the uh, Garden of Eden, where God asked Adam not to eat the fruit of the tree. But when God came and when uh, all those things were already happened, uh, when God asked Adam, hey, Adam, why, do, why did you eat that fruit? He said, you know, the helper that you gave, um, you know, the woman that you gave, you know, she encouraged me, uh, encouraged me to eat and she gave me. So I ate. And when the, you know, when he rolled his sin on her, when it was asked to her, she said, oh, no, it was because of the serpent. It was because of the serpent. You know, nobody took that responsibility. And the blame game was started from that very day. And I think it is going in our life. I want you to just look at, just to peep into our own lives where we judge people, where we look at, you know, uh, our peer group, you know, even, you know, uh, in, our, in our very close church groups also, yeah. Uh, you might have groups where, uh, you know, you come to a point and where, where you talk, hey, they can't, you know, that person and all. We, we just get into all those things and we think we are righteous. And that's what Paul is actually making a point over here. God's, uh, you know, God's judgment is, uh, is in accordance with the truth. You know, this is the essence of the righteousness of God. God is faithful, God is just and God is right. Uh, because uh, God is not partial. Thus, in verse 2, you know, you, when you read over here, we know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. God's judgment, God, judgment is right. You know, God's judgment is absolutely right. Uh, we cannot think that we are in a better position when we practice the very things, when we condemn others uh, for practicing, while we also practice the same thing, you know, we will never, we will not escape God's judgment uh, when we do not judge others for doing so. God is not going to show favoritism towards us. God is not going to show favoritism to us uh, because we read the Bible, we pray, and also we judge others. No, God is not a partial God. You know, we cannot think that it is not okay for the world to practice such things uh, or such sins, but okay for us because we are the people of God. Oh, we are Christians. Oh, we are believers. My name is Anthony, A-N-T-H-O-N-Y. Anthony, and so I am a Christian. You know, I can do whatever I want. But, you know, those people can't do that. We cannot conclude such things. And that's what Paul is basically making a point that God is not partial. 
you know, God never shows favoritism. You know, um, however, when, when, uh, you know, when we think of ourselves, we do not condemn ourselves, but we excuse ourselves thinking that we are just human and we can't help it. Oh, I'm just a human, human being. You know, when it comes to us, uh, we come to a point, I think it's okay and uh, there's the grace of God. Uh, God will definitely forgive us. But what about others when we judge someone else? Uh, we come to a conclusion, oh, this person will definitely go to hell. But let me tell you, uh, my friends, that this is a false thinking. This is a false thinking. Self-righteousness. We cannot think that these acts are not okay for the world to practice, but uh, it is okay for us to practice because we are believers, because we are Christians. We are not in a superior position where it comes to judgment, which is where Paul is now going to verses 4 to 6. Come on, let's read it out. Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard work and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Look at how God is, you know, God is dealing with the world. Or uh, when you look at the history, how God has dealt with the world, God has shown the riches of his kindness. He has shown the riches of his tenderness of his heart. You know, God has shown the tolerance. God has shown his restraint, long suffering. And he has also shown his patience. And the wealth of God's kindness has been with a purpose. One of the things that we get under, uh, you know, uh, under this impression where when we think about God's kindness, oh, God is very kind. And, you know, if we sin uh, afterwards, we go and we'll close our room and we'll pray and God will definitely forgive us because we know that there is a grace of God. God is kind. But let me tell you, friends, you know, God's kindness is not to be understood as a license to sin. But God's kindness is to be seen as the opportunity to seek forgiveness. You know, the wrath of God has been revealed against all godliness, against all the sins. You know, God's justice should land us on, you know, it, it should land on us immediately. But God is not only so kind, God is not only so tolerant, showing patience. You know, this overflow of kindness is basically, you know, supposed to be leading us to repentance. You know, it should push us, uh, push us to repent, not to judge others. You know, God's kindness is not a statement that God is not angry, that God is not angry. But God's kindness does not suggest that justice will not come. We cannot assume. I think we are very good in making assumptions. We cannot assume that God's kindness will never suggest justice on our lives. But God is also continuing to push back our deserved judgment. God does not, uh, God does this, God does this to lead us to repentance. You know, God does, does, does not want us to perish. If you read in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, you'll get over there that God uh, doesn't want anybody to, uh, you know, to perish. But rather, He wants us to repent. We have taken God's kindness as a license for sin. Uh, there are so many times where we consider that, okay, there's a license to sin because God is very, very kind. But I think... We see that Paul is basically directing this charge at Israel. Israel is not in a superior position when it comes to judgment. Paul spoke the same words about the nation uh, of Israel to the Thessalonians when you read in chapter 1, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, verses 4 to 16. You will get to know over there, Paul is basically saying, For you brothers became uh, uh, imitators of churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea, for you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did for the Jews who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. So as always to fill up the measure of the sins, but God's wrath has come upon them at last. Now God's response has all, always been in kindness, you know, but the people are storing up wrath for themselves because they are not using his kindness to repent but to practice the very sins that they condemn others for committing the righteous of god demands god's righteous judgment 
verses uh, 6 to 11. When we read in uh, Romans chapter 2 verses 6 to 11, we see over here, He will render to each one according to his works, to those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immor immortality. He will give eternal life, but for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. God is not partial and that's what we get to know from God's word this evening, that God is not partial. You know, for on, on that day, God will render to each of us according to our own works. We, uh, you know, our, our own books will be opened and we will be just according to our own works. You know, first we must notice that the criteria are the same. Uh, uh, in, in the same, for both groups, notice that twice in this section, Paul says the Jew first and also the Greek. The Jew first and also the Greek. And there is not a different set of measurements where uh, Jews and the Gentiles, uh, they can be, you know, judged differently. The Jews do not have an advantage. Both groups will be judged the same way. Amen. Now, when it comes to seeking, you know, when it comes to seeking uh, the, you know, uh, repentance, when, when it comes to uh, seeking forgiveness from God, Seeking is not a passive action, okay? Seeking is not a uh, passive action. Basically, you know, when we uh, come on this standard, uh, you know, uh, we might think, oh, so what is the standard by which every person's work will be judged? What is that scale? Or on a scale of 10, how we are going to be judged? Or what are those criteria where we are going to be judged? Basically, you know, there are two contrasts used to describe the terms of judgment. The first contrast we get to see in verses 7 to 8, the first criteria concerns that we, what we are seeking, what we are basically seeking. Are we seeking the glory, honor, uh, immortality that comes from God or uh, are we seeking or, um, you know, self or are we self-seeking? You know, what is your life pursuit? What are you looking for in life? Are we seeking what is best for us? Or are we seeking the things that comes from God? The second contrast that we get to see in verse 7 to 8 and also verse 9 to 10. Are we practicing good or practicing evil? Are we practicing good or are we practicing evil? What, you know, what are our lives full of? What is the foundation of your life? You know, basically, what are you seeking? That is the very question. And these are the standards where God is going to judge us. Basically, when it comes to seeking, seeking is not a passive action. It's not a passive action. The scriptures are full of caution to make, uh, you know, to make every effort, strive, uh, fight the good fight, press on the goal. We get to see in, uh, uh, in the epistle, uh, different epistles of Paul, where he is talking about pressing on the goal, looking, uh, looking, looking ahead, and forget uh, the past. You know, work out your salvation and and so on. Now there are no scriptures in the Bible which tells us, you know, which which tells us to just coast to eternal life. It never tells. Bible never tells us to coast to eternal life. You know, there is no passage. In, in instruction instructing us to float our way to heaven you know there, there is no floating there is no coasting there is no resting there is no sitting there is no relaxing our way to eternal eternal life but friends let me tell you eternal life is given to those who seek eternal life is given to those who seek now the question for all of us including me this evening is what are we seeking what are we seeking this evening? Verses 12 to 16. Let's read it out. It says, For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under, under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law 
by nature do what the law requires they are a law to themselves even though they do not have the law verse 15 they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience conscience also bears witness and their conflicting conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when according to my gospel god judges the secret of men by christ jesus amen now basically verses 12 to 16 explain further what is involved in verses 7 to 11 god will judge jews and gentiles alike justly because god is a just god god is not a partial god Verses 12 sounds very, uh, you know, I think uh, complicated, but you know, it's reality. Uh, in reality, it is very straightforward because God is impartial. You cannot say that, oh, God is partial. God shows favoritism to this group. God will show favoritism to Gentiles. God will show favoritism to Israel. No, God is not partial. You know, to, to, to uh, those that sin either with the law of Moses or without the law of Moses will perish. Uh, because God will not use the Jewish law to condemn Gentile sinners. Gentiles did not have the law of Moses. And this is what Paul is basically explaining in, in these verses. He is basically trying to tell us that Gentiles did not have the law of Moses and will not be judged by the law of Moses. Jews did have the law of Moses and will be judged by the law of Moses. It is a logical point that you know, uh, that, that is the foundation for the following point made in verses uh, 13 to 16. That is the foundational point that he is uh, actually laying. You know, hearers of the law are not the ones who are righteous before God. They are not the ones who are righteous before God. You know, only the doers of the law are the ones righteous before God. Paul will discuss justification more fully in chapter 3. When you go forward, you'll get to know more about justification in chapter 3 and you know, you will get to examine over there, but we are not going over there. As an aside, you know, this is exactly what James uh, taught in James 2 as much as, you know, there is attempted by uh, some to make a conflict between Paul and James. It is simply, you know, it simply is not there. They are in harmony. So over here, Paul has a more specific point toward the nation of Israel in, con uh, you know, in contrast to Gentiles. The Jews heard the law of, this, uh, of every Sabbath in the synagogue, but the regular hearer of the law uh, is not enough to be righteous before God, nor is hearing the law the reason God gave the law of Moses. The law of Moses was not given to simply, you know, it, it was not given simply to hear but it was given to be done. It, it was given to practice. It was not just given to, okay, you come to synagogue and you just listen, you hear, but you do whatever you want. But it was given, you know, to practice. Verses 14 to 16 reveal an example of doers of the law who were not hearers of it. You know, this is the twist that Paul is presenting. The Gentiles were not hearers of the law of Moses, but they are doers of God's law. The, Jew, the Jews are hearers, but they are not doers. You know, let's break down verses 14 to be more clear. You know, Gentiles who do not have the law uh, by nature. I'm just taking away the comma, uh, you know, uh, from being uh, between the words law and by and moving it uh, after the word nature. Uh, it is acceptable to do in the Greek and in the English and makes far more sense for this, for this text, basically. Uh, Paul cannot be saying that the Gentiles are doing the law by nature. You know, he cannot be saying that. By nature, we are children of wrath. By nature, we are sinners. Rather, uh, Gentiles was not in the environment and not part of their lives. It was not the part of their lives. They did not have the law of Moses. They never heard Moses. They never heard about the law. But they are doing the things that God's law requires, not the law of Moses. You know, they are doers, uh, but not the hearers. Being the hearer does not make righteous. You know, being, but being a doer, uh, when you see in verse 13, you know, they were seeking the glory, but they were seeking honor and immortality of God, which is what basically Paul is, Paul says the Gentiles were supposed to do in Romans chapter 1 verses 18 to 21. 
the seeking of the things of God shows that God's law was on their hearts. God's law was their desire. Now, I don't want you to go far beyond what Paul has written over here. Paul does not specifically examine or uh, he is not, uh, you know, examining all those different things. And uh, But, you know, actually, uh, he's not specifically explaining how the Gentiles had the law and there has been much written about it. It's not written over here. Now, I want to make sure that we uh, do not miss Paul's point over here in these very verses, uh, you know, in all our curiosity, when we become so curious, oh, what is he actually making a point? So Paul's point is that Gentiles did not have the law of Moses. They were not possessors of the law, but they were doers of the law because they were seeking after God. They were not seeking after the law, but they were seeking after God's own heart. They were seeking after God's own heart. The, the Gentiles had the law not the law of Moses and showed themselves to be the doers of the law. The Jews had the law of Moses and heard the law, but they were not doers of the law because they were not seeking after God's heart, but they were self-seeking. And this is the point that Paul is actually making. But this description of what Gentiles seeking after God uh, with their hearts is exactly what Jeremiah in his book he prophesied at that time in the OT you know would, would need to be done to be the part of the new new covenant because when you read in Jeremiah chapter 31 verses uh, 31 to th uh, 34 it says that behold the days are coming declares the Lord when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and house of Judah not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I looked them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, uh, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. The very prophecy. I will write it on their hearts and no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord. For they shall all know me for, from the least of them to the greatest declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more declares the Lord. You know, uh, if we look at this pro prophecy, don't we come to a point, you know, where Jeremiah, you know, prophesying where Paul said had now occurred in the New Testament? You know, people uh, would not be in a relationship with God, be, uh, you know, uh, with, with, with God uh, be being possessors of the law, but the law would be written in their hearts, you know, and they would know the Lord. Now they would be seeking, people would be seeking after God and doing God's will. And the Gentiles are showing themselves doers of the law and the Jews, uh, Jews are only showing themselves to be the hearers of the law. Now friends, this evening, uh, the point is, when we look at these verses, the point is that God is basically making a point through his word. That are we just the hearers of the word of God or are we doers? Are we just doing the, you know, uh, just doing the judging or are we just making the judgment part or are we uh, literally, literally hearing and uh, doing the word of God? And this is the point where Paul is actually making. 15th verse, it says that they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts. Amen. The work of the law is written on their hearts. Now, the question for all of us this evening, you know, are we, are we taking his word or uh, are we just listening to his word? Are we doing according to his word? Or are we in a point where we come to a point that, okay, I am righteous. I am not a sinner. I do not sin as my friend sins. I do not sin as my cousin sins. No. That is not a point where Paul is making. Paul is actually saying that, hey, listen, God is not partial because God is an impartial God. And he says in verse 16, on that day, when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. 
Amen. Now, you know, what you think, what you believe in your heart, uh, the New Testament is far much strict than the Old Testament. Let me tell you. Yes, we think that, okay, there is a grace of God in the New Testament. But let me tell you, this is more dangerous because if you think, uh, that, that's what the Bible says, you know, if you, if you, if you plan for a murder, uh, you have already murdered. That means you have already committed that sin. It's not about now doing. It's not, you know, just committing the sin. But it's all about, you know, if you are thinking, it has happened. But the OT was totally different and now the NT uh, is really challenging for all of us. Uh, let me tell you friends, let's not take the kindness of God as a license to sin. But let it sink in our hearts that it should lead us to repentance. It should lead us that we can see people around us as the way Jesus sees them. You know, not by judging them, not by uh, making a point. Oh, uh, I think this person will definitely go to hell. Oh, I'm not going to go to hell. Uh, you know, there are times when we sin and we come to a point. Um, I think I'm just a human being. It's okay to sin. I'll go to God and I'll seek forgiveness. Yes, definitely God does that. But let's remember that it is not, it is not a license to sin. Kindness of God is not a license to sin. Let's close our eyes and let's pray. Our gracious Holy Father, we thank you. For this word, we thank you that you are faithful. We thank you that you are kind. We thank you that you are not partial. Lord Jesus, we give our life in your mighty hands. And Lord, we come to you and we seek forgiveness for the things that we have done in our past, Lord Father. And we need your grace. We need your mercy uh, for the coming future from this day. From this very day, Lord Jesus, we surrender our lives in your mighty hands. And Lord Jesus, we pray that you you, you guide us, Lord Jesus. You keep us away from making all the judgment that we might have done in the past. Lord, we thank you that your word is so clear that you are not a partial God. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you, your word is so clear that we, we, we are not supposed to be the hearer of the word, but we are supposed to be the doers of the word. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your grace. We thank you for your kindness. In Jesus' name, we pray. Let's pray the last prayer. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all till the day Jesus comes. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you and have a blessed week. Mm -hmm.